Welcome to the study of fibers and textiles. Hopefully everyone made it into their pants all right today. And one of the things I love about forensics is that we get to learn about a lot of other disciplines that you might not have thought were related, uh, such as what you're wearing, um, the fabrics that make up the clothing that you wear. Take a look at some of these objectives that we'll cover. The basic idea is that Locard's principle of exchange is at work here. When a person goes to a certain location, they tend to deposit and pick up um, fibers, hairs, uh, different physical um, types of evidence. So for that reason, fiber uh, analysis is helpful to study in forensics. Um, there's a statistic I ran across that says that 95% of all fiber evidence is lost after 24 hours, so timing is really critical with this type of evidence. Here are several things we can uh, analyze, the type of the fiber, the color, whether there was violence um, based on if um, some of their, there's tearing exhibited uh, microscopically on um, some of those fibers, location of suspects, um, and point of origin. So again, microscopes can be helpful in analysis um, to reveal shapes, markings. Also, infrared uh, spectroscopy can help to um, reveal chemical structures um, and differentiate one fibers that look superficially very similar. Um, there are also some destructive testing methods, including burning, and um, so that would obviously destroy your evidence. It's a one-time uh, thing. This is an example of a burn analysis key. So this is like a dichotomous key if you ever use one of those in biology about um, like if your sample stops burning, then go to number two. Okay, if the fiber has the odor of burning hair, okay, go to number four and so forth. So it's um, a way of kind of narrowing down what you might be dealing with based on a burn test. So let's look at some different types of fibers. Now there are two major classifications. There are natural fibers and then there are synthetic fibers. Natural fibers are ones that, as their name suggests, are naturally occurring either from animals, plants, or minerals on the planet. Um, synthetic fibers are man-made. So does anybody know what this is? This is actually mohair from goats. So wool, cashmere would also fall into this category. Um, but um, mohair from goats, this is, what, this is what it looks like. And um, this is funny to me because uh, my maiden name was M-O-H-R. And so um, Microsoft, Microsoft Word would always tell me that, no, I was misspelling my name, that it meant to be mohair. And I would always think, I don't even know what mohair is. But that's not what I meant to type. Well, that's what mohair looks like. So um, angora from rabbits is also another type of um, natural fiber that is animal produced, and this is what it looks like. Um, I had a student a couple years ago who had an alpaca sweater. It was awesome. And um, so obviously some other um, animal generated fibers. Silk is another one we might not think about, um, but it comes from the caterpillar of cocoons and has to be unwound. And so it's very delicate and uh, tedious. And that leads to the expensive nature of the product. Okay, so um, switching gears here, we're still within natural fibers, but those produced by plants um, have the characteristics of absorbing water, um, not dissolving in water, which is nice with our clothing, um, being resistant to harsh chemicals. They can be dissolved by strong acids. Uh, case in point, one of my a mentor teacher of mine actually spilled hydrochloric acid on her jeans in a college chemistry lab, didn't say anything, walked home, she had a huge hole in her jeans by the time she got home. Don't do that. Um, but the jeans were probably cotton-based and so dissolved in that acid and become brittle over time. And those are made of the polymer cellulose, which is what makes up a plant cell wall. So still within the realm of natural fibers um, include other plant fibers um, such as cotton, as you see here. And uh, this is very common. Um, there's also uh, coir from coconuts, which is very durable, and um, hemp jute flax, um, as well as manila. This is manila. And um, it's interesting because the um, manila component of the name comes from the manila hemp. Um, and 
you know, you've heard of a manila folder. Well, manila folders currently are not made of this product, but used to be made of the actual manila um, from the plant. All right, third category would be mineral fibers, and that would include fiberglass. Looks like this is actually a form of glass. Um, also asbestos, and this is asbestos. Um, interesting thing about it, the mining of asbestos began about 4,000 years ago. Um, and really hit a large-scale production um, in the 19th century. Um, it's really, really nice stuff in that it um, is good for sound absorption. It's good for uh, a tensile strength and especially for fire resistance and its affordability. So lots of buildings were insulated with this. Only one problem. In the 1920s and 30s, it was realized that, oh, um, really small bits of, of this can be inhaled and that causes lung cancer. So that was stripped out of buildings. Um, occasionally, if you're, there's an older building that's been neglected, there may still be some of that in there. Um, but it became known that prolonged inhalation can cause that lung cancer. OK, part two, synthetic fibers. 50% of fabrics are currently artificially produced. Here are some examples, and we'll look at some pictures of each one of these. You may have heard of these or seen some on the tag of your clothing. The first one that we'll look at um, is um, a category of synthetic cellulose fibers. So these would be regenerated from naturally occurring cellulose plant-based. Uh, so that's rayon, selenese, which is a um, commercial name uh, for that product, and polyamide, um, polyamide uh, nylon used in performance clothing. So a couple things about synthetic polymer fibers, um, they're petroleum based, um, different from naturally occurring fibers, and that's the point, they're constructed to have certain characteristics. Um, monomers, which are small single units, repeat to form polymers, and fibers are spun together into yarns, um, and they have uniform diameters. This is big, when you look at um, a section of the fiber under the microscope, if it has some variation in diameter, then it may very well be a natural fiber. If it is very uniform um, in terms of its diameter and, and uh, under the microscope, it's likely to be a synthetic fiber. Polyester. Some of you may be wearing this now. Um, this is wrinkle resistant um, and uh, it also makes up, in addition to like jersey material, it can make up a, a polar fleece, like a fleece material. Um, and then also, uh, another synthetic polymer fiber is nylon, which is really common, um, makes up this rope, uh, although it is easily broken down by light um, and, and pretty similar to polyester. Okay, a couple other ones include um, acrylic, and I would venture to say that um, you are very likely to be wearing acrylic now. I would like to say that my sweater that I'm sporting today is a very expensive cashmere or perhaps a wool, but it's acrylic. It's usually a cheaper version. Um, that mimics the properties of wool, although it's often not as warm. And, um, and then there's also the olefin, which is a high-performance, quick-drying um, material like you see here in these um, athletic socks. This is a way that um, you can categorize the uh, traits of each one of these, and I would encourage you to read this. I'd like you to pause your video now. So um, looking at this from a broad perspective, yarns can actually include, I always thought yarn was just like a ball of yarn, like for art projects or something, but um, yarns are fibers of um, possibly different materials that have been um, spun together to form um, that, that yarn. Um, you can also blend different fibers to get different characteristics in the clothing. And um, fibers are woven, in, woven into fabrics in different ways. So the threads are arranged side by side, um, which is the warp. And then other threads, the weft, are woven back and forth uh, crosswise against the warp. And I'll show you what that looks like. So here are some weave patterns. Um, this is me when I was um, going to prom. And um, so uh, it was a really nice purple dress, great evening, we had a lot of fun. Um, you may have heard of a satin dress, and that's what that's what I'm sporting here. But um, satin is not actually a um, a type of fiber; rather, it's a type of weave. So you can see here that these specific types of weaves are helpful for different purposes. Now, the thing about satin, look at this, not durable. So if this girl's, you know, I mean me, 
if I were to like bend over here and try to grab something, you could have a tear in the dress. Um, however, it's very shiny. And look at this, the way that it is woven. There are two of the um, vertical uh, strands and then just one overlapping every two as it goes across. Now look at the plain or tabby. You know, this is really um, snag resistant. It's very durable, um, but it doesn't look quite as nice as I did in this dress here. A couple of other weave um, patterns as well. All right, well, thanks for joining in. This has been fiberific and fun and can um, be a very important type of evidence in forensic investigation.